Coming up on Tech News Today, telcos want to keep you in the slow lane. Tesla vomits up some car details about the New York Times review. And HP going Android. All that and more coming up. Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for Tech News Today is provided by Cashfly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. This is Tech News Today for Thursday, February 14th, 2013. Tech News Today is brought to you by Pond5, the world's stock media marketplace. If you're a media maker looking for video, photos, illustrations, music, sound effects, after effects, templates, or 3D models, check out Pond5. And for an exclusive 50 free stock media files, go to pond5.com slash TNT. Welcome to Tech News Today. I'm Tom Merritt. I'm Sarah Lane. I'm Maya Zaktar. And I'm Jason Howell. And this is the show where we keep you up to date on the most important stories in the tech world, starting each time with the top 10 stories of the day in the news feed. Spain's Secretary of State for Security, Francisco Martinez, and Europe's Director Rob Wainwright, your poll's director, Rob Wainwright, announced they have concluded an investigation into the operators of ransomware known as Reviton, resulting in 11 arrests. The 27-year-old alleged head of the operation was detained in the United Arab Emirates, and 10 others from Russia, Georgia, and Ukraine were arrested in Costa del Sol, Spain. The ransomware is estimated to have generated 1 million euros a year in Spain alone. Electric car maker Tesla has released logs connected to the New York Times review of its Model S that claimed, among other things, that the car had run out of energy. The Times' John Broder also criticized the Model S for range issues and for problems in low-temperature environments. But Tesla's founder and CEO Elon Musk says Broder's account of what happened was not factual. Someone has figured out a way to bypass the iOS 6.1 lock screen. It requires a whole bunch of steps, including dialing an emergency call, canceling that call, and not quite powering off the device. But in the end, you'd get access to the phone function, which in turn gives you access to voicemail contacts and more. If you're curious about all the steps, we'll have a link in the show notes. Every two versions of iOS. Seems like this crops up. The recently discovered zero-day tax against Adobe Reader can be prevented if users manually enable protected view from their preferences and security enhanced menu, according to Adobe. You just check the files from potentially unsafe locations or even the all files option, then click OK. Administrators can also enable that option across all their Windows machines. The attack is the first to overcome the security sandbox Adobe added a little more than two years ago. Google is suing British Telecom's group in California, claiming that BT has infringed on four of its patents and violated them. Google has also filed a separate case in the UK. BT launched its own case against Google back in 2011. That dispute has yet to be resolved. A Google spokesperson said of the suit, we've always seen litigation as a last resort and we work hard to avoid lawsuits, but BT has brought several meritless patent claims against Google and our customers, and they've also been arming patent trolls. ReadWrite.com reports that HP will release a new tablet soon. So what's it running, WebOS? Of course not. Sources say HP is making an Android tablet that will be powered by a Tegra 4 chip. ReadWrite sources also say the tablet would be officially announced maybe after Mobile World Congress later this month. The United States of America may have the most developed LTE network infrastructure in the world, but it's only the eighth fastest at an average download speed of 9.6 megabits per second. Sweden, the first country to ever turn on LTE, tops the list created by Open Signal with 22.1 megabits per second. Networks in Hong Kong, Denmark, Canada, Australia, South Korea, and Germany filled in the gaps between Sweden and the U.S. Most LTE operators use 40 megahertz of spectrum, but AT&T and Verizon only have 20 megahertz to work with, and Sprint and Metro PCS squeeze their LTE into 10 megahertz. Jim Balsillie, the former co-CEO of BlackBerry, then RIM, has sold off his entire stake of the company. That's based on regu regulatory filings. A year ago, he held 26.8 million shares and was one of the company's largest individual shareholders. Former co-CEO Mike Lazaridis, who still serves as vice chairman of BlackBerry, still owns 29.9 million shares of the company because at least somebody believes in the future. <laughs> 
Uh, the future isn't looking so great for NVIDIA, though. They have some bad news for investors. Forecasting Q1 sales ending in April will be about $940 million, indicating revenue of $921.2 million to $958.8 million U.S. dollars. Analysts were projecting revenue of $1.07 billion U.S. Weak demand for desktop and laptop PC parts is one factor, and NVIDIA's mobile move uh, with Tegra is facing some stiffer competition from Qualcomm than maybe they expected. A petition to the White House to remove Aaron Schwartz's prosecutor has now crossed 25,000 signatures and must receive a response from the Obama administration. The petition calls for U.S. Attorney Steve Heyman to be fired and calls his prosecution overzealous and reckless. This episode of Tech News Today brought to you by Pond5, the world's stock media marketplace. We talk about them all the time. They've been a great sponsor uh, for Tech News Today. And if you are someone who makes media, if you make videos, if you make audio podcasts, Pretty much anything you can think of, they've got stuff to help you. Go check them out. 10 million professional quality photos, vector illustrations, music tracks, sound effects, customizable motion graphics templates, 3D models, and more. Uh, so many people I know who work in the industry use Pond5 because it's just a great resource for B-roll, for illustrations, uh, and you don't have to worry about it. You pay once, it's legal in almost anything you can do, and if you're a media maker, you can sell your stuff too. You get to set the price. You have control over pricing. That's unheard of in stock media. And they pay out 50% royalties for each and every sale. So if you're a media maker or an artist, absolutely check out Pond5. Take your creativity to the next level or upload your own content and put it to work at the world's most artist-friendly marketplace for stock media. This month, you can get 50 free stock media files when you go to pond5.com slash TNT. That's pond5.com slash TNT. And we really thank Pond5 for their continuing support of Tech News Today. Also want to thank Clayton Morris, anchor of Fox and Friends on the Fox News Channel, for joining us. Uh, good to have you back on the show, Clayton. Hey, thanks for having me. Always great to be here. Always good to have you along. Let's, ta let's start off by uh, talking a little bit about these Spanish arrests. Uh, Spanish authorities in Europol say they arrested 10 people this month, six Russians, two Georgians, and two Ukrainians at Costa del Sol in southern Spain. Uh, and they had already, in December, apparently, detained a Russian 27-year-old uh, suspected to be the head of the whole thing. They got him in the United Arab Emirates. Uh, this thing was netting 1 million euros a year, as we mentioned. Uh, may have even been examining keyword searches. But what it was doing is putting up a, a screen that said, oh, you've been doing something illegal. So the keyword searches were important. They would look and say, is this person look like he's searching for child porn? Is he searching for copyright infringing material? Then they would put up a warning with the logo of whatever the local police agency was, maybe Europol, uh, and then ransom the PC, require you to send the money. We've heard about ransomware before. It's not that new. This, uh, this particular version was first detected in May 2011. There have been 1,200 reported cases in Spain since that. Uh, and the uh, Spanish police are the same ones who co cooperated with the Canadians back in March 2010 to end the Mariposa botnet and arrest all those people. Clayton, do you, should, should we make Spain the world's malware cops? They seem to be good at this. Yeah, they seem to be good at it, but of course they're going after, it seems like, small potatoes uh, or tapas, if you will. <laughs> um, pa papas frijoles. Papas tapas frijoles. Because really, this is if you look at the number here, a million euros is not really, it's kind of a drop in the bucket when you consider the larger problem of cyber crime across the, around, the, and around the world. I talked to a, a former NYPD detective who actually heads up cyber crime awareness and, uh, and works with the government to try to stop it. And he says the biggest problem, of course, is out of Russia. Um, so all signs point to Russia when you have this. And it's a you know, multi-billion dollar a year industry. Um, so this, in Spain, it, this is good work that they're doing. But I just think it's a, a drop in the bucket when you look at the larger problem, of course. And, and that is always the problem with these sorts of things. Uh, it's, it's like uh, in The Wire. You put the, you put the drugs on the table. You put the malware on the table, I guess, somehow. Right. And make it look like you're doing something. But how much has it really affected uh, the, the overall situation out there? Ayaz, what do you think? Well, I'm thinking if, if, if Spain is going after malware instead of like looking for piracy and craziness that way, maybe they're putting the right resources on the right problems instead of what we do here in the States, which is come after anybody who's ever like 
downloaded a movie or something. Maybe that's not. Maybe this one million euro number doesn't sound so high because we're used to crazy numbers in the states when it comes to piracy. Well, but if you, if you make the comparison to something like you know the drug trade, you can't just say, well, these are just the little guys, so we shouldn't arrest anybody. I mean, part of that is gaining intelligence on who is actually you know who are the kingpins of these sorts of operations by getting right. people to talk. I think also there's an awareness level. Maybe there's some sort of government awareness program that needs to take place with people because, uh, again, as I talk to these individuals about this, it's fascinating to me that they say that people are clicking on it. You know, there's like an over 50% click-through rate on some of these ridiculous, uh, you know, uh, malware attacks. Um, and whether or not their emails that they're receiving, having to send money off to some Nigerian banister, people are clicking on that and they're paying for it. Um, and it's remarkable to me the lack of education, especially in the older generation when they receive an email and they think, boy, this person is in trouble. I need to send them money right now. I, it's absolutely true. Education is, is one part of this and, and better uh, you know, software protection is the other part because education is only ever going to go so far. And arrest, like, like Sarah said, arresting people isn't a bad idea because of the intelligence you get. And that's at least a few people that aren't doing this anymore. Uh, but it, there doesn't, it, it's going to be a continuous arms race, right? There's just never any end in sight because they get cleverer and cleverer. I mean, even if you're educated about antivirus protection, et cetera, if you are searching for copyright infringing BitTorrents and suddenly this screen pops up and says, hey, we're Europol and we just detected you were searching for that bad stuff. Now you have to pay a fine. Well, that, that requires a little more sophistication to realize, wait a minute, that can't be right. And then are you walking into a trap, right? Then do you admit to it? Maybe do you actually reach out to Europol and say, look, I just received this email. And yes, it's <laughs> true. I have been searching for Avengers uh, on, on BitTorrent um, and episodes of Downton Abbey, but I'm not going to click on this. Did you guys actually come after me? And then you're sort of opening yourself up for them to come after you anyway. <laughs> well, no, we hadn't, but now we are. Right. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> exactly. All right, so let's uh, move on to uh, Tesla. Uh, we, we mentioned, I think, previously on the show that they were a little upset with the New York Times review, and they're going to do something about it. What have they done, Sarah? Well, Elon Musk, the te Tesla CEO, had said, listen, this, this New York Times reporter, John Broder, uh, who we gave a review, Model S Unit 2, uh, it, it, wasn't being truthful. It was a critical. Uh, it was a critical review of the Model S that said things like, "Listen, it, it, it the, the charge didn't last as long as it said it would. There were issues with the the cold weather. He was driving it, uh, it uh, between uh, several fueling stations along the East Coast, and it's winter there, so it's cold right now. Among other things, Musk said, "You know what? We have data logs. We 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 run data logs on any review unit because we've had issues in the past with media outlets." fabricating things they actually had an issue with the uh with british show top gear where there was a there was a scene where they pretended that the tesla had run out of gas and they were sort of pushing it back into a garage and uh, tesla went after them tried to sue them it got thrown out but musk says because of that sort of thing we're going to pay attention to exactly what you do so that when you say hey my 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 electric car ran out of energy we can figure out if you were actually using the car appropriately. So, uh, as as promised, uh, they have published their data logs um, on Tesla's uh, 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 site. And there are logs that say Broder drove faster than he said he did at, at critical times. Said that he drove around in circles in a parking lot for a while on a 0% charge. Why? No one really knows. It was That was not something that, that was part of his review, that he claimed to turn the cabin temperature down, but actually turned it up. Uh, he drove right past a public charge station when the car was telling him it was very low in its range. Um, and then the biggest claim was that the Model S had run out of energy completely. He had to get off of the freeway. He had to call a, a flatbed truck to get a tow. Musk says, we have these logs and it never ran out of energy. I mean, you're, you are fabricating things. What's very interesting to me is I understand that there is a little bit of, there's a, there's something about the idea of can an electric car actually replace, a, you know, a gasoline type car, a hybrid car, if I have to live my life the way that I, I you know, I wanted to, if I have to get from point A to point B and there's, there's a long distance and, you know, I have limited uh, places to, to fuel my car. Now, at least among the people that I'm following on Twitter who are following the story, there's a big debate as to, well, are these logs even truthful? And I think that's really interesting because I'm not sure it's, I don't know why Tesla would go out of its way to make up actual 
data logs that aren't true. But let's just assume that the numbers are true. Is this the only way that Tesla can keep reporters honest? Ayaz, what do you think? Well, I mean, I think reporters and journalists have a duty to be honest in the first place. And the fact that, that Elon Musk is going out of his way to make sure, look, we're going to show you these logs. I'm, I'm, I'm going to assume that, that they're true, unless they want to face some kind of lawsuit against from Broder saying, you guys are defaming me. This is not a good thing. Right. You can't just say this stuff about my reporting. Uh, it, it's just really strange that... Uh, if, I think if, if I read this right, uh, Tesla was told that this was going to be about the future of cars, not necessarily an actual test of how it would perform right. on the East Coast. And the amount of data Musk has in this blog post showing tons of logs, showing Google Maps, saying where all these stations are, I have no idea why Broder would want to make this up in the first place. But there are other previous quotes from him saying he, he doesn't think electric cars are the future anyway. So it's kind of this right. interesting thing of maybe he has an agenda but that seems really odd for a New York Times reporter. Does it, though? They have a history of some of these fabricated stories in the past. What was the guy that lost his job there that was fabricating interviews that he had done and never even showed up for interviews, created entire stories that were completely fabricated? Um, I think, you know, I think one of the, the one of the points that's made in this article is I think maybe the motivation is a sort of a salacious headline, right? That electric cars aren't the future and this thing can run out of, you know, run out of energy before you need it to. And, and you know, that's your, that's your, uh, that's your link bait right there. I think though he makes the argument, Broder makes the argument that he was trying to do practical tests because, you know, because he fired back on Twitter and said, I did not fake my results. But he says, I was trying to do a practical review where non electric car acolytes would be would find relevancy in this piece, um, which I think is dubious because he's saying that, you know, if the logs are true, then he skipped a charging station when he had 32 miles left available in his uh, in his battery and he had 61 miles to go. So that's not trying to be practical. That's just being idiotic. Well, I know I, yeah, I think it's 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 seen what happens when you when you run an electric car, you know, into the ground it's, without without a charge. I mean, it, 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 you probably wanted to figure out, yeah, I mean, what happens when when I get to that point? But if it's like, but if it's that's a, a practical that review, I mean, if being being practical and saying this is how real world people are going to expect to drive this car, that's fine. But you can't say I turned the temperature down when you actually turned it up, which would negatively affect how much how much uh, energy you have left. Right, I'll but tell you what it seems idiots, like though? to me, though. It seems like to me this is a guy who knows how to write a very good feature story and does right. not how to know how to do product reviews. And he, he wrote it as a feature story. He made some mistakes that he didn't realize he made. He drove it around in the parking lot in circles because he was trying to see how long it would go before the battery went out. But it wasn't a very assiduous review where he showed all of his data like somebody who does product reviews for a living would do. He made the kinds of mistakes you make if you're if you're new to this that are understandable and just want to write kind of a first person perspective of what it was like to drive the car. Uh, the only part I, f I feel like might be controversial, I, I think they probably did run it out of energy and he called a flatbed truck. I don't think he's lying about that. The logs may be inconclusive on that sort of point and Tesla's pushing it, but everything else just sounds like somebody's like, he didn't know there was a charge station there. He just didn't pay attention. Just sounds sloppy to me mm -hmm. right and he's driving around in circles reminds me of that kramer episode in seinfeld where he's pushing the guy <laughs> at the dealership to try to run out of gas yeah, it it yeah and it reminds me of, uh, of of when we do laptop battery tests right you just right. you just like run a video until the battery goes out because you want to log how long that battery lasted at that particular usage level which is consistent across laptops but this guy did wasn't doing it in a very scientific way well and elon musk is clearly i mean he's he's he, Seems like he has a bit of a chip on his shoulder about all of this because the whole model of of what Tesla is doing is you're going to get a really good range on these cars. I borrowed a friend's Model S just a few days ago, drove up to Petaluma. It was an 80-mile round trip, and I said to him about 40 times, are you sure I'm going to make it there and back because I don't want to get stuck on the freeway somewhere? And he was like, yes, you have so much energy. It's fine. But that is an actual concern that people have, and that's something that Tesla really wants to make sure that the public gets over. Let's uh, talk about HP getting over WebOS. Looks like they might move on to Android, right? Yeah, IS? read, write, web, uh, read, write, dot, I can't say that name anymore. Read, write, dot com. They've rebranded. Reports that HP is going to adopt Android for its upcoming mobile devices. And the first device would be an Android-powered tablet, which would, which would have an NVIDIA Tegra 4, which would also mean it's one of the first devices that have a Tegra 4 chip in it. Uh, the tablet apparently has been in the works since before Thanksgiving. And read, write, sources say HP is exploring the launch 
of an Android-powered smartphone as well. HP is going to hold private meetings at Mobile World Congress where it could show off the device. Nobody knows exactly what's going on there. And an official announcement could be around after uh, Mobile World Congress. Clayton, do you think Android-powered devices could be successful for HP? I mean, there's a lot of competition when it comes to Android tablets. I think you hit the nail on the head. <clears throat> there's a lot of competition. When you walk into a Best Buy, for those of you that ever actually go to a Best Buy, you'll see that sort of windblown station with all of those Android devices that are powered off and no one's standing around them because they all look the same, they all act the same. And they're really not selling that well. I think the last sales numbers we saw of like the Samsung Galaxy Tab, I think it was like last August, kind of came out in a court filing, if I remember. I, they weren't, they were pretty terrible. Um, and really, it seems like the only Android tablets that have gained a lot of traction, maybe the Google Nexus 7 and also Kindle Fire. But if you look at that, it doesn't look like an Android tablet at all. And I think, you know, what Amazon did with the Kindle Fire is put their own skin on it. It really doesn't look like Android at all. I think they would have had a better tactic going forward if they would have found a way to revitalize WebOS, give something else out there um, that would be exciting. I mean, people were excited about WebOS. You still have those loyalists out there who were sort of hoping for a Palm comeback. I don't know. I don't know if there's enough differentiation uh, from HP here to do something magical in an Android-powered tablet space. Tom, do you think it's better to go with Android or go at it on, on your own with WebOS from HP? Well, I think it would take all kinds of flack if they went back to WebOS as their only strategy right now. So what I would expect is them saying, we, want, we need to have a hit if we're going to get back into the phone market. Android is a safe bet. Uh, to make a hit, or back in the mobile market, I should say, not phone market. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's a safer bet. Uh, we're not going to take flack for choosing Android. Uh, and, and if it fails, we can say, well, we were choosing the top platform out there that, that is available to us. I, they can't use iOS. So I, I think this is probably the only move they can make. And then they can still come out with a WebOS tablet down the line if they prove that they can, they can make tablets out of Android. Or even if this one fails, they can follow up and say, well, now we're going to try WebOS, which has been an open source and, and being developed. But I think if they led with WebOS, uh, it, it just it would be too difficult, and it's probably not ready still. Sarah, based on one of Clayton's points, the idea that HP would do Android... Should they be skinning it to a degree where the consumer doesn't recognize it as a stock Android the way the Kindle is? Or should it be a stock Android experience or something in between? Well, I mean, I think the idea of skinning it is if it looks nice and it works in a way that no other you know, company has in a handset, then HP says, well, it's Android, but it's a cool, different Android. We're the better Android. We're the best one. See, it's very, very different than that silly Samsung phone that you could have bought instead. But it sort of feels a little bit like a desperation move to me as well. Um, I think, yeah, HP is kind of out of options. So stock Android experience, I don't expect. I expect some sort of skin experience that HP hopes will stick with, with the public who at least is familiar enough with Android to know, oh, that's a popular operating system. That's a good way to go. I'm definitely getting it. Go ahead. I think you, well, I was going to say, I think Sarah hit the nail on the head too with, and she makes a great point about the stock part of Android. I mean, if you look at maybe some of, I don't know if you can throw this stuff out or not, but if you look back at some of Leo Apotheker's comments back in the day, and I don't know if those points are moot at this point, but if you remember what he was saying was, you know, that uh, they were bleeding money, obviously, with WebOS. They couldn't continue to support that um, with Palm. And that they were, th that Google and Motorola was going to be a behemoth that there was no way they were going to be able to compete with Google and Motorola. And I think that's where you're going to see the stock Android experience. So are you going to try to go up against that? Or are you going to try to do something skin that's unique and interesting uh, that maybe people don't recognize as Android, but gives offers people a, you know, a superior user experience? I'm kind of curious about HP and Google being together. I mean, the HP just released a Chromebook. If they come out with Android-based tablets, maybe there's more trouble for Microsoft in the long run when it comes to that. But, I mean, I could see if one day, maybe if HP gets the, if they can really make a quality product, if they become the Nexus brand at some point, because obviously Google picks different partners for that, maybe they could become something really huge for Google at some point. Yeah, no, I think that's a really good point. Uh, HP kind of needs to cozy up with Google at this point to diversify their partners and, and, and not get left out. Uh, let's talk about a new bill coming to Georgia. Why, you ask? Because it, it may have repercussions for your ability to get high-speed Internet. House Bill 282 is called the Municipal Broadband Investment Act. It would prevent municipalities from rolling out broadband service in any area they control if one home, one user in a census tract has 1.5 megabit per second or better Internet. 
Uh, this is being pushed by AT&T and Windstream for lobbying. Now, as, as, a, as a reminder, the FCC defines 4 megabits per second as minimum broadband level. So they're not even meeting the FCC's definition of broadband. But it, this is uh, something that's been tried a lot of times with, with varying effects. It was failed in Indiana, but it's passed in North Carolina and South Carolina, where the telcos come in and try to prevent municipalities from getting into the business of rolling out fiber. The argument for letting municipalities do this is that it further boosts accessibility for rural areas that might not otherwise get broadband, and it causes competition to spring up. In fact, there was a, a town in Georgia that was saying, hey, we rolled out internet to our, our uh, municipality, and suddenly telcos came in and started rolling out faster internet. It's, and then we, we took ours away. We said we didn't need to do it anymore. So it's a way to spur innovation. Telcos say, no, 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 the municipalities and government have no business getting into the free market and competing with us. It's, a, it's unfair, uh, and we should be allowed to let the free market have a say in how we roll out broadband. Clayton, what do you make of, of these sorts of legislation? Well, I think it's outrageous, number one, that you would have these, these telcos basically saying, hey, we, you know, we're not going to come into this town, the small town in Mississippi or whatever, and do anything here. But we don't want you to do anything to try to bring uh, information and the Internet to folks who live there. It reminds me of, and perhaps we need to use some of this, because there's a lot of senators who complain, uh, and I've talked to them. They complain about this Rural Electrification Act, of course, from like 1936, and they complain about government waste. And they say, we still got this Rural Electrification Act, which if you'll recall, back during the New Deal, uh, tried to bring electricity to farms and in parts of the country that didn't have access to electricity. But that's still around. It still exists. And they're saying, we need to get rid of it. And I would say, why not modernize it? Why not begin to make incentives for the telcos to come into these small towns and actually do something with the existing infrastructure that the government already has? We still have this Rural Electrification Act. Just update it. Make it the internet. Uh, make it the internet, uh, I don't know, come up with something government and bureaucrat uh, bureaucratized uh, as a, in a name. But... Uh, I think modernize it and make it available. I asked you, do you think the uh, telcos are, are being uh, whiny for saying, we're not going to build out the infrastructure, but we don't want anyone else to either? I mean, whiny is, is a, good way, a good word for it. I mean, there are a lot stronger words for it, I think, I want to use, but I can't use them on the air. But I mean, I would love to see a bill like this that actually said that the municipalities couldn't build anything Unless, assuming that there was a 1.5 gigabit option available. That would be fine with me. That would spur competition. Everybody else should be doing something as opposed to letting the government do it instead. 1.5 megabits is incredibly slow. Just be, I mean, I'm very curious about this idea of where is that test going to be and this, and this, this census tract of 1.5 megabits. If, you, if, if you've ever been on anything above that, going back is incredibly slow. It just feels so much slower than you've ever experienced that's just the wrong number. If it was four even, I think that's not enough. Just, just turn this on its head, make it 1.5 gigabits, and have everybody else compete. I feel like it's tilting the, uh, the playing field in, in, into the direction of the telcos rather than leaving an even playing field. And the argument is saying, well, you're, it's an uneven playing field if the government is involved in this. I, I say let the taxpayers in the municipalities decide if this is a way that they want the government to spend their tax dollars, their local tax dollars or not. That's, that's, what, that's the way government's supposed to work. You shouldn't have people who have a vested interest in not having the government do something come in and, and get the state to outlaw it for the municipalities. That just seems the wrong way to do this. Yeah, the tough... The techos yeah, can't argue. The like, government needs to stay out of this. These people should only have 1.5 megabits per second. That's plenty. We have no incentive to roll out any better infrastructure. I mean, that's that's not working on behalf of citizens at all. And 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 they shouldn't be doing that either. Government should stay out of it, except for taking our lobbying money to pass a law that tilts the playing field into our advantage. And then, they, but then after that, then they yeah. should. Stay. Don't worry, we'll roll it out eventually. We're very busy. We're a telco. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. I mean, <laughs> yeah, infrastructure is ground to a halt in the United States. Verizon's not rolling out FiOS. AT&T's not adding a, any kind of high speeds. I mean, it's it's a bad situation. This is exactly the wrong time to play around with something like this. Uh, but let's play around 
with <laughs> moving around. This has kind of become your beat, Sarah. The, uh, the What's going on with Sidecar, ride-sharing service? Yeah, so Sidecar is uh, one of the, there are several uh, uh, sh ride-sharing services where this is not sort of a taxi that has a license and, and someone who hails the taxi. This is me, I have a car. I maybe want to make some extra money driving other people around. Ayaz has an app, the Sidecar app. He hails me. I go pick him up. I take him from point A to point B. And then there's a transaction between between two people. Sidecar has acquired another uh, ride-sharing service, Hayride, which is based down in Austin, Texas. To, they go uh, out on hay trucks and share those? No, it's hay like. Uh, oh. Hey, man. Hey, girl. Gotcha. Uh, yeah, Hayride. That, although, you know, maybe they thought about that and I'm just not getting it. That's very clever of you, Hayride. Uh, so the two companies are merging and uh, they're going to introduce uh, service, uh, sidecar service down in, down in Austin. But also they say they're going to expand to Los Angeles and Philadelphia this weekend as well. You might remember on my ride sharing beat last month, I, I noted that Lyft had rolled out in Los Angeles. So that's an interesting market, uh, especially because it's so spread out and so many people are used to uh, riding around in their own cars. And of course, these, these apps allow users to not only connect drivers and passengers together, but it also manages the identity and the ratings of drivers and passengers. So, you know, if I'm a horrible passenger, eventually I'm not going to get picked up anymore. And the same goes maybe for a driver who doesn't really understand how the city works or, 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 or drives erratically, that sort of thing. So the system's supposed to get better over time. And at first, Sidecar is only going to be providing rides on the weekends in its new markets. It's recruiting drivers. In other markets, though, Clayton's Market, New York City, Chicago, Boston, Washington, D.C., the company says we're rolling out all over the place. Uh, they also, down in Austin, plan to be fully operational in time for uh, the interactive portion of South by Southwest, which happens uh, in mid-March, which is probably really, really smart on their part because not only do people have to get around Austin and, and, and there's a shortage of pedicabs, but it's just really, it's a, it's a, it's a good boost uh, for the company. I took, I took a Lyft, uh, Sidecar and Lyft are, are two different services, but, but they have similar business models. I took a couple lifts over the weekend, and I, I I love to chat up the drivers. Just like, why did you decide to become a driver? Do you have a day job? Do you like this? And everyone always says the same thing to me is, this is a new service, and there's so many more of you than there are of us, that if I want to drive around on a Saturday, I, I, got, I got rides the whole time. I can make a lot of money. I wonder, as these services roll out, is the demand going to keep up with the supply to make it lucrative to, to become a sidecar driver in a market where it's dependent on uh, getting a lot of rides. And then the union jumps in, right? Exactly. I mean, this is going to be the this is going to be the big issue in some of these big cities, and you have you have the battle in New York City right now between the uh, you know the town cars and the and the pedicabs versus the, versus the uh, the union cab uh, drivers. Um, I don't know. I mean, I think it's. I was a little nervous. I, I, was, I was a little nervous for you, Sarah, and hearing about this. I mean, as a, as a woman, were you at all nervous about just randomly getting in the car with some, some random driver? I mean, it seems to me, I mean, I guess it's sort of the Airbnb thing. You've got these ratings. You know that this person is reputable, I suppose. Mm -hmm. um, but although, I guess in many, and although in many cases, you know, these services are fairly new. The person might not have negative reviews, but they don't necessarily have a lot of positive ones either. Right. There's not enough, of, there's not enough data there for... For a lot of people to be, you know, jumping in somebody somebody's random car and maybe seeing this as an opportunity to do some unseemly things. Well, goodness, I wasn't I thought about, about it that way. I was I was thinking about this would influence the way I would would decide where to live. I mean, I want to see the like coverage area for like FiOS was one things I was considering when I was moving around or where where Verizon is when it comes to coverage because that's m my network. I would actually start looking around if I was looking for a new job or something like that. Like, what places don't I need to have a car? So the idea of demand, I think people actually flock to these areas because they don't have have to deal with the idea of having a car. Like that example we talked about with L.A. last week, that place, you need to have a car because it's not built for walking at all. It might actually attract more people to have less cars. I'm thinking that could still have the same impact with sidecar. Tom, do you think uh, do you think rolling out in uh, in a variety of cities that obviously have very different landscapes and uh, where people have have different transportational needs is the right call? More cities yeah. is better. No, I, I do. I I think and 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 I'm just 
speaking from the 10,000 foot view here. I'm sure there's there's problems with it in minuscule, but I think overall having different experiences in different areas that have different transportation needs is is, is definitely a key uh, and going up in the battles against uh, the different unions and the different taxi cab medallion systems, et cetera, et cetera, is, is really important. Let's move on to Microsoft CFO Klein saying he's ready for all device sizes. What, is, what, is, what does this headline mean, I ask? Yeah, Peter Klein was talking at the Goldman Sachs conference, and he says some notable quotes here. We're getting closer and closer every day to re, uh, write once and run anywhere. We can have the same, uh, we have the same core code based driving form factors from four inches all the way up to 27 inch ones and everything in between. But he also noted that it's not operating systems that matter in the end. He's saying that it's the common experiences, apps and services. That's what really matters to consumers. Uh, Clayton, do you think right ones run anywhere? Is this just a dream of developers or does this actually benefit consumers at some point? It's hard to say yet. I mean, I think we're seeing some of the limitations of Windows 8, right, on the run everywhere sort of idea right now. Um, you want to reach up and touch a screen sometimes and you can't on certain devices. Um, I'm not entirely sure that it's it's great for consumers yet, but you look at like the Surface, and uh, you know they every commercial. I think there's a whole new crop of commercials out there now, right? With the, the clicky keyboard thing, they, they just saw the new one the other day. I don't know if it ran during the Super Bowl or not, um, but you, you wonder with a smaller device, are they going to push because you, know, you push so heavily on the keyboard angle as a big selling point? Um, I don't know that the smaller keyboard works so well on one of these devices and having having a, a smaller keyboard on a, on a seven inch tablet for Microsoft works so well. Um, you know, when you're at the events with Microsoft, they're, they're pushing big time. They want to show you the keyboard. They want to show you how clicky it is. That's the first thing they want to show you. They rethink their, uh, rethink their marketing strategy when they hold another event. Tom, don't you think different form factors require different style of applications? I mean, a four inch screen shouldn't have the same application as a desktop. That seems like it just wouldn't work. Sure, but I think you I think you might be able to have it both ways, right? I think what they're saying is the operating system doesn't matter. It is the interface that matters. It is the device that matters. So the operating system can have the same code base, and then somebody can create an application that is meant for a tablet or is meant for a laptop, uh, and you and you don't run it. Uh, and maybe it even detects and says, oh, you can't run this on a phone. But that means that but the operating system is still the same so that it's easier for developers to create across those platforms and port their apps from one platform to the, the other. So that if I make a Windows phone app that gets really popular, it's very easy for me to put out a Surface version of that app and then a Windows 8 version of that app. So I'm not sure that those two things are mutually exclusive. Uh, I mean, and look at, look at iOS. You can, you can make a universal app uh, that has a different interface on the iPad than it does on the iPhone. No, see, I think the operating system does matter because if you use Windows Phone 8 and then you try to use Windows 8, some of the ways to close applications, gestures, they're not the same on both platforms. Sarah, do you think that inconsistency in the operating systems could be a problem? Or could these, this uh, unified app or the style that Tom is talking about, the universal apps, could that take care of that? Um, yeah, I think universal apps in general are great. But as you mentioned, Tom, sometimes there's an iPad app and an iPhone app that it's not just a bigger version of that. We've, I think in, in operating systems in general, I think we'll, we'll continue to see the trend where whether it's a mobile application or something that's designed to run on a desktop, they should act and look more and more similar just because the lines are blurred now between when is a good time to be at your PC and when is a good time to sort of be off with your mobile computer or your tablet somewhere else. I think, yeah, I think Windows has a challenge there. If if the user experience is constantly, ah, how do I close this program? Oh, it's on the other side. That's not good. That's that's a, that's a that's bad UI. Yeah, I mean, I, that that's the experience I've been having with my with my Windows devices. I'm like, they should work the same when it comes to interacting with the operating system. The applications so, work the same. So fine. you want you want a single operating system? Not the necessarily. Fact that you've got two different ones. Want, is your problem? I want consistency from the. It doesn't have to be the same thing. Like if the Xbox, if I can wave my arm up instead of using a, like a four finger swipe, that's the same kind of thing. But it should be a similar feel for each one that way you're only learning it once just like you're learning the applications once right one operating system exactly <laughs> maybe <laughs> all right let's uh, move on to the randomizer a uh, brain machine implant is being described by nathan ingram on the verge.com that has been tried in mice and allows them to see infrared uh, so it's it's a it's a sensor that ties into a part of the brain that is used for touch 
but it allows the mice when they see infrared lights to sense them. And what they did is they they taught them uh, to go towards LEDs that were in the normal visible spectrum and get a reward, and then slowly replace the LEDs with infrared. And, to, and eventually the mice started going towards the infrared lights. Now, one thing they said was that at first, because it was in the touch center of the brain, infrared, they, they responded to infrared lights as if they were feeling them, but eventually learned the difference uh, between that. And so they have created a sixth sense. Uh, in fact, they say that the rat's sense of touch was unaffected uh, once they rerouted to think of it as light. And that's the big thing here, right? They could use the touch center of the brain to create a new sense without affecting the sense of touch. Yeah, the lead researcher said it was almost like the cortex was dividing itself evenly so that the neurons could process both types of information. And what that means in, 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 in practical terms, because mice are so similar to humans, is that at some point, if you had a loss of vision, maybe you could take your own, you could tinker with the human brain, re reallocate uh, the cortex, and then you could see again. It's kind of this crazy idea of how this can be applied in the future. But then, what would you be seeing exactly? You'd be able to follow infrared trails? Well, I guess you'd just be able to see infrared bouncing off of things. You might have a sense of vision. It might not be the same yeah. that you had, but well, maybe, maybe, new. Yeah, maybe the ability to understand, oh, that's where the, how, how far away the wall is, that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Isn't this like what Jordy LaForge had in Star Trek The Next Generation? <laughs> It sounds like it's maybe better. Well, yeah, right. He could see in all the other spectra. So, right. right. I think I think what they could do, like like Ayaz is saying, in a stroke victim, that the vision center is damaged. They could move vision over to a different part of the brain and teach it to see. And they could teach it to see visible light, too. It wouldn't have to be infrared. But why not? Why not add in x-rays, too, and ultraviolet? And once they do that, can they figure out how to send the light back out of the eyes so you can have laser beams? Like Cyclops. Now you're on the side. Exactly. Now, visors. That. That's the key. Visors <laughs> for Cyclops, visors for LaForge. Get on it, science. Let's check the calendar. So there's a big asteroid that's going to buzz the Earth, uh, but you don't have to worry about it too much. Uh, NASA's going to live stream the event. It's 150 feet. Uh, that's a big asteroid, uh, but no one's expected to be hurt. Um, there's actually, we'll put a live stream link uh, in our show notes because it's probably kind of a fun thing to follow. It was really great knowing you guys. I mean, this was inevitable, right? This was a right. good run. What did we get? We got to 690. By Friday, it'll be 692 92. episodes. It was a good run. Yeah, yeah it, was a good, it was a really good run. And thanks, uh, Clayton, for being here towards the end. Sure. I'm glad to be here on your last episode. <laughs> Before the apocalypse. Uh, and let's see what's incoming besides incoming the asteroid. Message. <laughs> we got a message from Josh. He says, I was listening to yesterday's show, and I think you have missed the hook in regards to the camera on Intel's TV set-top box. Remember that they are working with the content providers extensively during the creation of this device and that these partners are in fear of dwindling ad revenues threatening their business model. I don't believe it is a far stretch to see this camera being used as a monitoring device. If the camera sees more people than the content provider wants to watch a single viewing of the content, then you might just see a prompt asking you to purchase a site viewing license due to the number of viewers exceeding the standard license. Oh, Maybe I'm paranoid, but I can see that being a reality in the not-so-distant future. Keep up the great show. Uh, who, who sighed like that? Was that Clayton? That was me. Oh, Tom. <laughs> what do you think? I, you know, actually, I, DVRs were resisted and DVRs won, right? DRM has been resisted. DRM lost on audio. It seems to be winning on video. So it's not, a, you know, just because something is possible doesn't mean it'll catch on. I'm sure people would not be amenable to a system that said, oh, if you have more than three people in, in view, then we're not going to lie. And, of course, hackers will come up with a way around it. But I, just don't put any ideas in people's heads. That just seemed like the craziest idea. But anybody yeah. like, oh, we have a new service. It's not a value proposition. It's got the same bundles, and we'll charge you more when you're watching. Yeah. With you, friends. You've got a friend. Get off that couch or pay up. <laughs> okay. Everyone out of the room. I'm going to start the movie, and I only wanted to see one person. Sit perfectly then you guys still yeah. and all black over there, please. <laughs> All right, that's it for uh, this episode. Uh, Clayton Morris, always a pleasure, my friend. Uh, thanks for joining us again. Well, thank you guys for having me. Always a, always a treat. Let folks know uh, what you got going on at ClaytonMorris.com, where they can find you online. Well, the big thing that, that's been eating up my time this past year, and, uh, and I, th I think Sarah knows about it. I think she did it on iPad today. Um, but uh, hit number one on iTunes a few weeks ago is my iPad application called Read Quick. 
Um, so I've been, we just uh, had a big update that just came out yesterday, it lets you read really fast. So if you've got a pocket queue or your Insta paper queue, you want to get through it quickly, um, helps you speed read basically one word at a time. You're actually, your comprehension goes up um, and you can get through those long articles that you sort of aspirationally save to your pocket or Insta paper queue. So we're working on an iPhone version right now, which people have been asking for. So that is uh, next in the line right now. Yeah, it's, it's a great app. I did review it a few weeks ago. Go Clayton. Thank you. If only I knew three people who had to read mountains of news articles every day, right. this could help. Yeah, exactly. I mean, this morning I had to go to the doctor's office with uh, for our, our baby's nine month checkup, and uh, and I said I got to go over the rundown. I got to go over the rundown for tech news today. And Natalie's like, um, "Hello, you have uh, your app? Read quick." It's like, "Ah, oh, yes." <laughs> I poured through every story in a few, in a few minutes. That's great. Yeah, she said she actually used it when she was on uh, a while back, and it helped out a lot. So check it out. Yeah. Read quick. Uh, you, you can also check out our subreddit, techthewstoday.reddit.com, if you'd like to have a say in what stories we cover. Uh, it's not definitive, but we definitely consult it every day when we create our lineup. So get in there and submit stories and vote up or down on the current stories. Uh, you can find us on the web at twit.tv slash TNT. You can also email us. Our email address is TNT at twit.tv. And give us a call. Leave us a voicemail. Our phone number is 260-TNT-SHOW. If we all survive the asteroid, we'll be back tomorrow. See you then.